Okay, so uh, in a second, we will start our presentation. Um, just a couple of notes. Uh, we have a Q&A uh, feature running in this Zoom call today. If you click on Q&A, you can submit a question. Uh, we will be doing our best, uh, my colleague Cecilia, who is behind the scenes, will be doing her best to answer the questions in the chat, so please keep an, sorry, in the Q&A, so please keep an eye out there for your, your question to be answered, and we will also try to answer some of the questions after the presentation, so please do feel free to submit your questions there, and also, um, before submitting your question, please do check whether the question has already been asked and upvote the question um, if uh, you also wish to hear the answer to that question. That will give us a sense for the most popular questions and the most important ones that we should uh, answer. Okay, I'll stop sharing this uh, poll now. Um, yeah, pretty interesting results. Um, there are more people who have not yet applied than who have applied. So today, of course, me uh, and Rebecca, we have a presentation for you guys. And I would say it's a very comprehensive <laughs> uh, presentation. So there is something both for students who have or applicants who, who made your applications already. And there, for those who are planning to make an application, there's information for you as well. So regardless of where you are in the application process or phase, um, th there is um, useful information for you uh, today that we're going to share. Um, I can still see the poll. I hope everyone has, has uh, seen the result now. 62% actually have not yet made an application to learn, and 38% they already have made an application. Of course, uh, it's quite new. The application system or for international programs, it just opened a bit more than a week ago. So it's open now for all our international programs here at Lund University. You can apply uh, to them uh, today if you want to, uh, if you would like to come here and join us next autumn, autumn 2023, of course. We're going to talk more and in great detail about that uh, during the presentation. Exactly. So maybe we should just quickly also introduce ourselves. You can see uh, on the screen that um, my name is Rebecca and I'm an International Marketing Manager at the uh, International Marketing and Recruitment Team here at Lund University. And I work, I'm from the UK originally, and I'm also an um, alumni of the university. And now I work uh, with various regions uh, supporting recruitment. And Johan, would you like to? Yes, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, I'm in the same position as Rebecca, also an alumni of Lund University. Uh, working as an International Marketing Manager here uh, since 20. Uh, 10 is when we started. So we've been doing this now for 12 years, uh, a bit more than 12 years, actually. I mostly deal with students coming from East Asia um, in my daily daily job. So if you are from East Asia and you have communicated with us via email, most likely you will have communicated with me or will communicate with me at some point if you decide to make an application. But um, as I mentioned previously, we have a fairly comprehensive PPT to go through uh, for you guys here. Um, when we are presenting the PPT, you are still welcome to use the Q&A to, to post your questions to our colleague uh, Cecilia, who's in the background answering questions in the Q&A, uh, if you can't stick around until the very end. Uh, but for those of you who are willing to stick around, and we hope most of you are, uh, the remaining questions in the Q&A, Rebecca and I will handle and answer orally um, after the presentation, the PPT has concluded. But I think uh, let's just get into it, Rebecca, right? And, yeah. and dive into the PPT itself, because it, it is fairly long. <laughs> and comprehensive. Lots of information to share with you guys here today. Uh, on the agenda, we're going to talk a bit about Lund University, just give you some basic facts really uh, about the Lund University for those who don't know much. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about the bachelor's and master's degree programs we have uh, that are international taught in English, of course. Um, we're going to go through the application process and an application checklist. We're going to speak about living expenses, the scholarship that we have here, and other funding options for international students coming to, to learn. We're going to share some tips, our tips and tricks for how to make a successful application. And then, of course, at the end, there will be a live Q&A with me and Rebecca. But as I said previously, please don't, if you can't wait until the end and you have a question that you need to get an answer urgently, uh, don't hesitate to use the Q&A and write your question there. 
uh, because our colleague Cecilia is in the background answering questions in the Q&A. But yes, uh, Rebecca, would you like to introduce Learn the University to our audience members? Yes, great. Okay, so uh, Learn the University is a very uh, old <laughs> university. We were founded in 1666 and we are a comprehensive and research intense university with nine faculties, um, meaning that we offer a range of subjects. We have 46,000 students and 8,400 staff, and 27% of our students are international students from over 130 countries. And that percentage is slightly higher in our master's programs than our bachelor's programs. We have over 140 degree programs uh, taught in English, our international programs. And we have many world leading research environments, um, particularly of note, are two of our research facilities, Max4 and ESS, which is the European Spallation Source. So yes, uh, we also recently uh, have been given the great honor of being ranked 12th in the world in the QS Sustainability World Rankings. Uh, so we're really, really proud of this uh, achievement that has just been announced. Uh, we are also 49th place in the Times Higher Education Most International Universities in the World Rankings, uh, and we are also extremely proud of this uh, reputation uh, for internationalism and being able to offer this uh, international experience at our campus. Okay, Johan, would you like to... Go sure. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, the, the, the sustainability uh, ranking that was just actually released, was it yesterday, Wednesday, right, by yeah. QS? It's incredibly exciting. We're super proud to be acknowledged in this way uh, by an organization such as QS, the number 12 in the world when it comes to sustainability. So uh, we have here at Lund University both bachelor's degree programs and master's degree programs that are taught in English, of course. Uh, for the bachelor's degrees that we're going to talk about now, we currently have nine different programs that are taught completely in English. Um, so in Sweden, uh, bachelor's degrees or bachelor's programs, they are three years in duration and they are course based and they conclude with a thesis. Now, just to explain how, how they are structured a little bit, uh, most bachelor's degree programs would start with a block of kind of mandatory courses that all students need to take. It could be the first, second, and even sometimes the third semester that are mandatory courses. And then after that, you would probably be presented with a choice, either do elective courses or uh, maybe do an exchange or an internship or something like that. So the, it's a combination of mandatory courses, elective courses, and the opportunity quite often to do an exchange or an internship. And then you conclude with the thesis the, the last semester. So this is very interesting and exciting. I think we have a couple of programs in science, a couple of programs in business economics, one in social science development studies. We also have music and fine art actually. So there's a little bit for everyone here. And these programs are fully taught in English, of course, and last for three years. So what about the entry requirements? Uh, well, the entry requirements is you must have successfully completed your upper secondary school studies by the time that you apply. And we want to emphasize this point because it sometimes is uh, potential applicants, they uh, misunderstand this requirement. And basically what it means is that if you have successfully completed and that you're able to prove that you have successfully completed your upper secondary school studies by a document deadline, which is on February 1st, uh, 2023, then you're eligible to apply. If you are currently in a situation where you will finish your upper secondary school studies sometime in the spring or even summer of 2023, uh, you are not yet considered eligible. And we will have to ask you to kindly postpone your application until next time it's possible to apply because you're not eligible yet. Um, so it's very important to point this out for us so we avoid uh, disappointment and misunderstandings later on. Uh, but if you have finished high school or upper secondary school already, you're welcome to make your application. So you need to provide uh, your upper secondary school document, official documents, of course, but you also need to be able to prove your English language proficiency. And I think we're going to go into more, more detail about what this actually means yeah. on the practical level. But you need to have achieved something we here in Sweden refer to as English 6. 
And there are a number of different ways that you can, you can get approved for English if you want to study at university in Sweden. Uh, there are English tests, previous study country or language of instruction in your previous studies, etc. We're going to get, go into a bit more detail about that later on. Um, please go ahead and visit University Admissions in Sweden. Um, dot SE, which is a national application system used by all Swedish universities and that we also use. So if you want to make an application to a program at Lund University, you're going to have to go through universityadmissions.se and make your application there. Now, also very important, and this is regardless if you're applying to a master's level program or a bachelor's level program, there are country specific instructions and requirements for you, and these can also be found on the University of Admissions in Sweden website. So say if you are German, you studied in Germany previously, you would have to look at the country specific requirements for Germany. If you were in Brazil or South Africa or in China, doesn't matter where your merit country is what matters here. So if you are, say, an American who studied in Australia, you would have to look at the country specific requirements for Australia. Uh, and this is regardless if you want to apply to bachelor's or master's level, because there are different requirements for both, but you have to follow the instructions that they give you on these country specific information pages, because it, it can be very detailed, you must have completed this level or that level in, in your home country in order to be eligible to apply for university level studies in Sweden. Um, so it's important to make sure that you fulfill the requirements and that you're able to provide the documents in the way that they uh, tell you to, basically. Some programs at bachelor's level have program-specific requirements, and when it comes to bachelor's level programs, it's usually related to the major that you want to pursue, of course. So if you want to take a, a science program, you need a certain level in for example, mathematics and physics or chemistry. Uh, and if you want to study business or uh, social science, you need a certain level of social studies in your study history from upper secondary school, sometimes combined with a certain level of mathematics. Um, so all the programs that we have have these some type of requirement for you and your study background in order to fulfill the requirement and be um, eligible for admission to a certain program. So Rebecca, over to you. Now you have to explain how master's degree programs are offered here and yeah. learned. Thank you. Okay, so uh, as uh, as Johan said, then our bachelor's programs are usually uh, three years in duration, uh, but our master's programs are usually two years in duration, uh, although we do offer a few which are one year in duration. We have over 130, or no, sorry, we have 130 uh, master's programs uh, taught in English. And these are also uh, course-based and concluded with a thesis or degree project. So similar to the bachelor's, um, there will usually be some compulsory uh, elements to these master's programs, particularly in the first year of a two-year program. And then in the second year, you will usually be doing some kind of more independent project or research um, and some kind of specialism uh, with electives. And then that will conclude with a degree project of some kind. Okay, so uh, we have such a range of master's programs and what makes them quite special uh, is that many of them are interdisciplinary, meaning that they span various subject areas. Um, and we have some really niche, unique uh, programs that we're very proud of. Um, also something which our current students often note is that our programs are very much up to date. Uh, we have uh, researchers working at the cutting edge of technology, for example, and um, our programs are based on this research, this current research um, connected to industry, business and society. So many of our programs are very applied. Um, as I've mentioned, you have the opportunity to tailor your coursework with electives, which is offered in many programs. Um, so if you have a very specific interest, you usually, uh, within your subject area, you can usually pursue that. And internships or study abroad options uh, are quite common. All of our masters will prepare you for a PhD um, and a continued research career, should you wish to do that. So they're great for that. 
For the entry requirements, they're a little bit more straightforward than the bachelor's, I would say, because usually you must have been awarded a bachelor's degree or be enrolled in the final year of your bachelor's degree program. And I think we will uh, speak about that further uh, a little later on. Um, and you also have to prove that you meet the required level of English 6, which again, we will, we will talk about more. Um, but just as with uh, the bachelors, many of our programs have program specific requirements which relate to previous study that should be relevant to the program you're applying to in most cases. There are some programs where they are more open to a variety of different previous studies. For example, our entrepreneurship program um, is more focused on your experience with entrepreneurship rather than what specific degree you come to the program with. Um, and you can see why that would be the case. It's kind of logical that uh, certain subjects uh, don't require as much previous knowledge as others. But most of our programs will require that you have already reached a certain level with your subject knowledge before you then go on to your master's. And you can see exactly what each program requires on the program pages. There's just a note here that there is no GRE or GMAT test required for entry to our programs. There are one or two programs where if you have a well-balanced, um, good result for your GMAT, for example, you are welcome to, um, to submit it, but it is not required and usually will not um, come into the uh, assessment very much. So don't feel that you must uh, submit a GMAT um, even for those programs. And then as already mentioned, for both bachelor's and master's, you must carefully read your country specific um, requirements on university admissions, uh, because we mentioned that you must have a bachelor's, but for certain countries, this means four years of study, and for others, it means three, for example, there's these kinds of differences which are really important to note. Um, so definitely go to your country specific uh, requirement page on university admissions and check what that means for you. Okay, uh, right. Jan, would you like to talk through the English language? Sure. Uh, we have referred to English 6 in this presentation, and a lot of people would like to know, well, what is English 6 exactly? How do I prove that I have this uh, level of proficiency? Um, so English 6 is required for most programs, I would say the vast majority. So the, we're focusing on English 6 here to, to make you understand what this is. And there are different ways for you to prove your English language proficiency. And I know that sometimes people say, well, I'm I'm American or I'm, I'm, I'm British. I, do I automatically uh, get approved for English language proficiency based on my, you know, nationality or my mother uh, tongue? Um, and that is actually not the case because all students, regardless of where they come from or where they study, they have to prove their English language proficiency. And previous studies is one way to prove your English language proficiency. For example, if you live in an English speaking country and you took your upper secondary school education there, uh, you would get approved for English language proficiency, English 6. Or if you uh, studied in an English, maybe you're not actually from an English speaking country, but you studied in an English speaking country for your upper secondary school education or for your uh, university uh, bachelor's level education, uh, then you can get approved for English language, uh, English six, sorry. Um, but there are some caveats in here because it could be that you are from a non English speaking country, but your education was taught in English. Uh, then there are different ways to, to be able to prove that you reach English 6. And I would have to refer you to uh, University Admissions in Sweden for detailed explanations in case you studied in English, but you're from a non-English speaking country, for instance, or uh, if, if, for example, you studied some of your education, a certain number of credits in English in, say, the EU, um, at a university in the European Union, you can also get approved for English language proficiency that way. But it depends a little bit on how you studied, where you studied, and how many credits you earned, etc. Uh, so if you can use this uh, as proof of English. Of course, it's also very, very common for students who come from uh, non-English speaking countries to prove their English through an English test. And we usually refer to IELTS and TOEFL perhaps as the most common test, but there are others as well. There's a, a Pearson, there's Cambridge Academic, etc. 
uh, but not Duolingo, however. I, I think we, we, I'm saying this now because I'm anticipating that we might get this question. Um, Duolingo is currently not approved for university level studies uh, to, to show proof of English language proficiency. So IELTS, TOEFL, Cambridge, Pearson are the most common, I would say. And the level you need or the score you need to achieve in all of these tests, you can find on the University Admissions in Sweden website. But basically, just quite quickly, uh, IELTS, you need 6.5 average score with no section below 5.5, for instance, to get English 6. Uh, for the TOEFL test, you need 90, TOEFL IBT 90, with uh, the written section has to be at least 20. Um, so in, in that way, you can prove your English language proficiency if you have not studied in English previously. Also, of course, a tip here at the bottom of the slide, if you need to take an English test, IELTS or TOEFL, or Cambridge, Pearson, etc., book it now if you haven't done so already, because we have noticed that, especially during the pandemic, it was difficult in certain countries to book a test time. There, there was a waiting list. You had to wait several months. Uh, but still, we have time now because the deadline is February the 1st, 2023. So if you need to take an English test to prove your English language proficiency, make sure that you're able to do so in a timely way so that you can provide the result to us no later than February the 1st, 2023. All right, Rebecca, back to you. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, fees and funding. And it's in uh, the place where you can find the fees is on the program pages. Uh, the reason why we ask you to check there is because the fees vary depending on which program you're studying. And that's often related to, um, for example, how much uh, like um, maybe resources are required for that program. So for example, a program such as maybe architecture where you're using certain software and technology um, may have higher fees than certain other programs in case you're wondering why that is. Um, so go to the program pages, check the tuition fees section. It's important to note here that EU or EEA citizens are exempted from tuition fees. There are also some other exemptions which you can also read about on university admissions, but the vast majority of non-EU citizens will have to pay tuition fees. Uh, shall I continue? Yes. Please do. Uh, so in terms of the dates, the key dates uh, that you need to know, the international application round is open from 17th of October to 16th of January, which means you are able to apply now. Um, all documents are due by 1st of February. So that means that you actually have to click and apply by 16th of January, but you get a little extra period to upload any important documents that you may uh, have not quite got online. Um, but the 1st of February is a very, very strict deadline for your documents. So if you don't uh, upload everything that you need to by then, unfortunately, your documents will not be considered. So please do make a note of that particular deadline. Um, admission results are announced uh, in April for bachelor's studies, and then studies start in late August, uh, early September. So, yeah. So for um, bachelor's studies, you can also, you do also have an option if you are an EU citizen, um, then you do also have another application uh, period, um, which runs from the 15th of March to the 17th of April. The reason why uh, we call this sometimes the Swedish application round because it is the round where most of the Swedish applicants apply. But also if you uh, do not need a residence permit, so you are, for example, an EU citizen with the right to reside in Sweden already, um, then you are able to apply during this period. Um, if you are a non-EU citizen and you need to apply for a residence permit after you receive your acceptance, then you can't apply in this round because you will not have time to apply for and receive your residence permit before the studies begin. So that is why we have uh, we do not recommend that any non-EU um, fee-paying students apply within this second round. Um, for this second round, then, 
sorry, uh, Joanne, if we go back just one second, um, then your documents have a later deadline. So uh, your documents would be due by the 21st of June or 5th of July in certain cases, but admission results will not be announced until late July. Um, so yes, there won't be very much time in between admissions being announced and studies starting. So that's just another thing to note if you apply in that round. Yeah, and I think we can add here because it's not actually on the slide, but uh, if you do decide to use the so-called Swedish or second admission round, you're going to ha have to actually use the Swedish language application portal, uh, which is, it looks identical to university admissions in Sweden for international students, but it's in, in Swedish language. Just a side note. Yeah. Um, yep, so then when to apply for your master's study, so that the previous information was for bachelors, but for masters, just as with bachelors, the uh, international application round is already open 17th of October to 16th of January. And again, all documents are due by 1st of February. For master's studies, admission results are announced in late March, so just a little earlier than the bachelor's results. Um, but again, the academic semester also starts in late August, early September. Okay, uh, yes. Um, Johan, would you like to, to continue sure. with this? Or? Absolutely. Uh, we have mentioned this website uh, several times during our presentation. And if you haven't visited uh, this website yet, you should do so as soon as possible. Uh, universityadmissions.se is the website. It's a national application system, national application portal. So this is where you would need to go to make your application to Lund University. And this is not only a place where you make your application, it's also where you find a lot of relevant information, of course, about uh, eligibility requirement, English language requirement, country specific requirement, dates, uh, key dates, etc. So I would actually advise you to go here today uh, to find uh, information. Sometimes information is buried under several layers we have noticed on this website, so you have to dig uh, sometimes to find relevant information for you, but it's all there. Um, all the rules requirements uh, with regard to eligibility and everything else, you would find information on the University of Mississippi Sweden website. So let's say that you have made your application already, or you're about to make your application quite soon, which we recommend. What are the you know, good things that you need to know in order to make sure that your application is complete? We have uh, made a little list for you. First of all, go to University Admissions in Sweden, the website, and create an account. And now, creating an account there is very simple. Uh, you provide your personal details, your email address, basically, and then you just create your account. After you have created your account, you can log in, of course, to make sure that you are actually logged in. And then, of course, uh, we come to step two. You select your programs. Now, in my opinion, uh, it's best to first check our website uh, to find information about our programs because they on the University of Missions in Sweden website, you can find the programs, but there is hardly any information about the program content or anything like that on their website. It's basically just the program name, the duration, and, and start and end date, etc. Uh, but if you go to our website first, lunduniversity.lu.se, you can actually find very detailed information about program content and all the other relevant stuff that you need to know about the program before you make your application. But then you go to University of Admissions and Sweden website, you, you search for the program there at Lund University and you add it to your program application. Now, if you are applying to master's level studies, um, you can choose up to four programs, and for the bachelor's applicants, you can actually choose up to eight different programs for studies in Sweden. Then uh, we, I think we should be clear here that it's actually possible to apply to more than one Swedish university if you would like to. Maybe you have one program in Lund and one program at some other university that you're uh, equally interested in. You can add both to your application. Um, but of course, you have to rank your program choices uh, when you do that. So that is what we're coming to here, three, rank your program choices. And this is something that many people um, perhaps misunderstand during the application process because it could be different from country to country. There are different systems. Maybe you believe that, oh, I applied to four different universities and I can 
I can get four offers uh, when when they have done their uh, assessing assessing of my application. But that is not the case. We are asking you to rank your program uh, choices in order of preference. So hopefully you will have one learned university program as your your top choice. You put that as number one, and then your choice number two, three, four, etc. will be your backup options basically so the one program that you really want to get into the most at the university you really want to get into the most please make sure to place that as number one when you rank your program this is done after you have selected your different programs the university of business in sweden website will ask you to rank your choices before you actually click submit uh, on your application um it's also important i mean first of all I told you, you can apply to many programs, but you cannot get many multiple offers at the end. Even if you're, uh, even if all the programs that you apply to want to offer you admission, they can't. So program number one, they will be first in line basically to have a chance to offer you admission. And if they want you, they offer you admission and programs number two, three, and four, they will be deleted from your application. They can no longer uh, offer you admission. If program number one does not want you for some reason, um then program number two they get a chance to offer you admission etc but only you can only ever get one admission offer in the end also of course if you are relying on a scholarship awarded by lund university we're going to talk a bit more about the scholarship uh, application later uh, but if you're relying on our scholarship the lund university global scholarship uh, in order to be able to come here and join us in learn uh, then we will only consider you for this scholarship if you have learned a lund university program as your number one choice so other universities in sweden they run a similar policy if you want to go to some other swedish university rather than lund you should put their program as number one then you are uh, eligible to apply for their scholarship program but if you want to come to lund and you need a scholarship place our program as number one now rebecca told you about the time uh, or the, the, the various deadlines that we have. Of course, it's very, very important that we follow these deadlines because they are hard. They are not soft. Um, so if, if you miss a deadline, uh, then unfortunately there is a real risk uh, that your application can't be considered. So first of all, the most important deadline for now, I would say, is to actually make create an account in the University of Amazon Sweden, add the program or programs that you want to apply to and you submit your application. Now, the deadline to do this is January 16. So there's still, you know, two and a half months, a bit more than two and a half months left to actually do this. Um, but please do it as early as possible if you know that you have already found the program or programs that you want to apply to. Then, of course, after you have actually submitted your application online, uh, the next step for you would be to uh, submit your supporting documents. Um, so all the supporting documents, all your official uh, documents that you have uh, been given by your home university or upper secondary school in support of your application. Usually it will be a complete transcript, of course, if you have uh, finished your studies, and also some proof of graduation, a degree certificate and or graduation certificate, depending on the country or the system you studied in. Um, it's. I would like to point out that in many cases, not all, but in many cases, if you are from a non-English speaking country, your uh, degree and your official documents will most likely have been issued in the original language and the native language of your country. Uh, then, of course, it's also required for you to hand in an trans official translation of those official documents. So in that case, you would need both the native language of your country and an official translation into English. And it's always best and probably recommended if these all these official documents are issued directly by your home university if, if that is possible otherwise you're going to need to use a trans professional translation company to translate the the documents uh, so all the your official documents documenting your previous studies and also proof of english language proficiency it has to be in by the february 1st deadline uh, we cannot wait if you say oh i'm scheduled to take an ielts test and the result will be it will come out on February 20, for instance, this is just an example, then unfortunately that is too late. You have to be able to provide your test result for English no later than February the 1st in order for us to consider your application. 
Now, Rebecca, do you want to yes. tell uh, uh, what is can... a bit more about these documents? Exactly. We can go through this a little bit more detail. Um, the kinds of things that you will have to upload. So if you're a bachelor's applicant, then you must upload your record of your completed upper secondary education. As we mentioned earlier, it must already have been completed when you upload the, the, um, in the documents. Um, preliminary or expected grades, unfortunately, cannot be considered. Um, you should also upload your um, a degree certificate or diploma if you have one of those. Um, your proof of English language proficiency. So we've already talked about the different ways in which you can do that. That could be your IELTS uh, test result, or it could be based on your previous studies, in which case you need to refer back to the English language uh, information to check which way you uh, should prove your English language proficiency and what documents are required for that. Also, you will always need to upload some kind of identification document, so a copy of the page in your passport with your personal data and your photograph or another official ID document. So it must be officially issued by your home country. OK, uh, for masters, then again, you will need your, your previous education, so your transcripts and your awarded degree certificate, proof of your English, English language proficiency, a copy of the page in your passport, and if you are in the final year of your bachelor's studies, you need to submit official documentation certifying that that is your situation, that you are enrolled in your last year. And you submit your transcripts so far. And then as soon as you receive your final transcripts, you also will um, upload those. So before you actually begin your studies, we'll look at your final documentation, um, but you will receive your offer on the basis of um, whatever you've submitted so far. Uh, again, it's so important to check the country specific rules, because not only will that tell you what um, you have to think about in terms of eligibility, but also what you must think about in terms of your documents. As Johan mentioned, there will be information on there around translation, um, what exactly that means for you, which uh, languages are accepted or what you must do, um, and also specific information relating to your qualifications um, and what we need to see there. So please do check the page very carefully to, to make sure you have everything you need for your, um, for your documents. Then there are also program specific documents. So this is really important to note um, that most of our master's programs will ask for additional documents on top of your um, previous education transcripts, for example. So these could be a CV, um, a statement of purpose, which sometimes gets referred to as either a personal statement um, or other terms, but we call it a statement of purpose, um, or in some cases a portfolio, for example, if you're applying for an architecture program or an art program, um, you may need to also provide uh, evidence of your previous uh, work. So where do you find that uh, those instructions? You again go to the program page and you look at the section entitled program specific documents. There will often be um, a actual link there with further guidance. So for example, about what they want to see in your statement of purpose, what kind of questions you should think of when you're writing. Um, if there is no guidance there, then my uh, recommendation would be to think about uh, what specifically about the program appeals to you and think about your authentic connection to this program like why are you interested in it and what do you hope to gain from it that's just a general tip there but like in terms of if there isn't specific questions being asked but please carefully read the program page because often there will be specific guidance around these documents you only have to submit the documents which are mentioned in that section. You shouldn't submit additional documents. For example, if they don't ask for letters of recommendation, you don't need to add those and that will potentially just confuse the staff. So just stick to what has been requested. Um, for bachelor studies, there are usually, in fact, hardly ever any program specific documents um, required. So uh, generally speaking, bachelor's programs are uh, considered you're considered for bachelor's programs based purely on your academic merits 
Uh, oh, wow, we're still on step five. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> Many steps um, to complete. So the very, uh, yeah, one of the last stages, I think, uh, of the of the application process is to pay your application fee, um, which uh, you need to pay. It's 900 krona for anybody who is a fee payer. So again, usually that means a non-EU citizen. Um, and you must pay that uh, in order for your application to be assessed. So that fee directly goes to the national admissions uh, website, university admissions. And um, that's not something we charge you. Um, so you must pay that in order to be assessed. There's only one application fee per application round. Even if you apply for multiple programs, different universities, you just pay once each time that you make an application uh, during an application round, I mean. Uh, the application fee payment must reach university admissions by the 1st of February, meaning that you shouldn't make the payment on the 1st of February if you can avoid it. Please try to make it beforehand so that any, for example, bank transfer can be completed before the 1st of February. Right. I think also I want to add here that for you, uh, maybe you don't know the, the value of the Swedish currency currently. I wouldn't blame you if that's the case. So 900 Swedish krona is roughly 80, between 80 and 85 euros, something like that, at current exchange rates. And this is um, something we are not be, we, we can't waive this fee because it's not paid to or collected by the university. It's, it's, it's as Rebecca said, you pay to university admissions in Sweden. And this is their fee for, for basically uh, processing your application. Exactly. Um, however, if you are an EU or an EEA citizen, you do not need to pay the application fee because you are fee exempt. Instead, you have to submit proof of your EU or EEA citizenship um, so that they can verify that you are fee exempt. Um, that will be a copy of your passport or another official identification document which clearly states your citizenship status. And the document deadline for that is the same as with all the other documents, 1st of February. So those are the two deadlines that we have been mentioning repeatedly. So I hope that this uh, is something you're going to take away from this presentation, that the 16th of January is the deadline for you to select the programs that you want to apply for and to rank them. And the 1st of February is the deadline for all your documents to be correctly submitted and for either the application fee to be paid or you proved your exemption. Excellent. So now we're going to talk a bit about, we've talked so far mostly about uh, preparing your application and what documents are needed, et cetera, and how to make your actual application. But a lot of people want to know what happens after they have made their applications and after they have submitted uh, their documents, et cetera. So of course, the first, it's a two-step process here. First, University of Michigan and Sweden will process your application. And once it has been approved by them, it will be forwarded to the university or universities that you have applied to. Um, and we have something called selection criteria because a lot of students want to know how, how we select students. And, and Rebecca mentioned for the bachelor's applicants, it's basically your high school, upper secondary school GPA that matters. That's the only thing we look at. But for other students, it could be uh, different things. Um, it could be, for example, that we look at your, your uh, study merits, um, what type of, yes, GPA, if you will, or scores on relevant courses, grades, et cetera. Could be uh, in combination with other factors, such as the extra supporting documents you provided, like the, the content of your statement of purpose or your CV or any kind of relevant experience that you may have that is useful for, for this program. And could be your English language proficiency. How do you express yourself uh, in the English language uh, through your, uh, your documents, for instance? This can also play a part. But all the programs that we offer here at Lund University, they do have uh, their own selection criteria for what is important for them. And there you can find out how they select students for admission. So again, you would need to go to the program pages on our website and see, okay, so for this program that I'm interested in, I want to apply to, how do they, how do they select students? Selection criteria, that's how we select students. So as mentioned already, uh, the admission results, I mean, we, we understand that the, this is potentially a very long wait for you if you make your, get your application in very early, submit your supporting documents, you pay the application fee, and you, you just want to get the result. Am I admitted or not? 
unfortunately, because the way that things work here in Sweden with the national application system, and they have many, many thousands of applications to process, and then they also have to be uh, further assessed by the program or programs that you have applied to. Uh, so there is a, a bit of a wait, uh, and you're going to have to be prepared to wait until March 30, uh, 2023, to find out if you were selected for admission or not. Um, for the master's applicants. If you're a bachelor's applicant, you're going to have to wait an additional week. So early, uh, sorry, late March and early April is when our students are notified about uh, the selection to the programs. Now, moving on, uh, we're going to talk a bit about uh, money, money matters, uh, student budget, etc. What can we say or, or, or what information can we provide about a realistic, you know, budget for a student, international student coming to Lund? Uh, uh, Rebecca, you have, I am Swedish, so I am quite used to the, the price levels of everything here, but you came here as an international student. Uh, maybe you're more qualified to, <laughs> to speak <laughs> about this particular topic from, from, uh, from the point of view of someone coming from uh, the outside to Sweden. What can we say about yeah, that? Yeah, I'm happy, to, I'm happy to talk about this. So, um, yeah, of course, it is going to, how you feel about the cost here is going to vary depending on which uh, country you have arrived from and also a little bit how you live, like how you spend money and what you think is important and this kind of thing. So we generally recommend around uh, 850 euros a month, whatever that converts to in your, in your home currency, um, to cover your living expenses such as food, housing, etc., um, we're going to, I think, touch on housing a little later, um, but that can often be one of the, the main costs that people have, um, but there are quite a good uh, options available there, so we'll come back to that. Um, yes, I have to say, when I uh, arrived, I did notice the difference in uh, living costs uh, with certain things, for example, with food. But again, it does really depend how you budget and how you um, how you plan and whether or not you want to go out and eat in a restaurant or whether you want to bulk cook on a Sunday. And, you know, it really de it depends on the individual quite a lot. Um, it's important to note that if you're a non-EU citizen, um, you have to show before you get your residence permit, you have to show that you have savings, um, the funding for your living costs um, for one year in your bank account when applying for the residence permit of around that same amount, around 800 um, euros per month. So it's important for you to like bear that in mind and to know that you can't um, apply for a residence permit counting on, for example, finding work you have to already have your savings ready to show that you can afford it um, before you come. So this is a good figure to have in your mind um, as a rough guide, I would say. Um, yeah, so I can also continue and talk about some other funding options that may help with this. Uh, so our main source of uh, scholarships that we offer is the Lund University Global Scholarship, which we sometimes refer to as LUGS. All non-EU citizens, so again, all fee payers are eligible to apply. This scholarship offers a partial discount on your tuition fee. So between 25 and 90% of your tuition fee, which can be very helpful, of course, for many students to have that kind of discount. But unfortunately, it does not cover living costs. So you have to still think about what we just discussed, keeping those savings aside for your living costs. Um, also, the scholarship is merit based, so based primarily on your academic uh, achievement, as well as the short statement that you write, and it is extremely selective, so we don't recommend that you count on this alone, but of course we encourage you to apply if you're eligible. Um, we also uh, often uh, promote the Swedish Institute scholarships. This is an external uh, organization, um, very well known, very reputable organization in Sweden. And citizens of certain countries are eligible to apply for a scholarship through them. The Swedish Institute Scholarship um, for Global Professionals offers both tuition fees and living expenses. So as you can imagine, this is an extremely uh, popular scholarship for those who are eligible. Leadership experience is required um, and it is also very selective. So we always, 
always advise that you look into other options as well, such as program specific scholarships, which are sometimes available, and country specific scholarships. So you, you may wish to um, look on our external scholarships page on our website, you may wish to do your own research um, and look into what funding options you have from your home country. Um, it's really important to cast a wide net when it comes to funding and look into as many options as possible, I would say. Uh, other funding options, yeah, as, as we've said, don't rely only on these scholarships that we've just mentioned. Search for external scholarship organisations in your home country. It's a very common route. Uh, and also, of course, you can look into bank loans and grants. Try to see if there's an option which is financially uh, viable for you. And always have this plan B for how to fund your studies, because if you don't receive the one scholarship that you have your heart set on, for example, then it would be wonderful if you have a backup option and you can still join us. Um, start looking into the options now to make that more uh, likely. Okay. okay, thank you, Rebecca, for uh, speaking uh, about the, the money money matters and this is very important that all people have a realistic plan uh, for for how uh, they should budget um, when they come to Sweden. and some people as Rebecca said it depending on your you know your home country context you may find that Sweden is more expensive or cheaper for certain things uh, depending on what you are used to I my advice would be uh, mostly Cook most of your own meals. If you, if you're able to cook <laughs> or learn how to cook, if you can cook most of your own meals, that's where you can save a, a, a ton of money every month. Because going to a restaurant or a cafe like two or three times per day in Sweden is not realistic, basically, and hardly anyone does that. I would say almost no one, in fact, uh, would do that. Um, so if you are able to cook and cook most of your own meals, you're able to save a, a lot of money. But now we're going to round off this presentation with uh, some of our best tips for how to make a successful application. So number one tip, of course, make sure that you meet all the entry requirements uh, we have before you make your application. Um, check the program, uh, sorry, uh, country specific pages on the University of Missions in Sweden to learn about the eligibility requirement for students coming from your country uh, or in your where you studied previously rather. Uh, so again, if you, your nationality is not what's important here, it's where you studied previously, what we sometimes refer to as your marriage country. Uh, so check the information on the University of Missions in Sweden website to make sure that A, you're eligible and B, you're able to prove that you're eligible through sending the correct set of documents, etc. Make sure that you have accepted proof of English language proficiency by a document deadline uh, or take a test as quickly as possible. Now, we know sometimes people say they contact us, oh, it's very difficult to get it get a test slot in my country because uh, whatever reason uh, but unfortunately it doesn't matter what regardless of the reason you you have to be able to sit a test or take a test and be able to show us the result before February the 1st uh, we cannot budge on this requirement so you have to make sure that you're able to prove your English language proficiency by February the 1st no later please uh, as for making the application online, you have to choose to rank your programs no later than the 16th of January. You can actually, because sometimes we know that students, maybe they have two or three, even four programs that they're interested in, but they don't want to, be, they're not ready to make kind of the final decision on how to rank the programs. You can still make your application today and change the way you have ranked your programs later, if you want to, up until the January 16th. It's not necessarily something I recommend, but I can understand if you are in a situation where you're not quite ready just yet today to, to make the final um, decision on how to rank your program. So there is still room for you to, to change the way you have ranked your program choices and even add and remove programs from the application. Uh, the deadline for this is January 16. So after that, it's not possible to change the way you have ranked your choices or to add any new programs to your application. So do not miss this deadline. Of course, you also need to pay the application fee or prove that you're exempt, uh, if you can, um, as early as possible. Because what happens is with the University of Missions in Sweden is that unless if you're fee liable, they will not touch 
your application until you have paid the application fee. And if you're a non-fee liable, that is EU EA citizen, they will still not uh, touch your application until you've proven that you're fee exempt. So this is something you need to do early on if you want university admissions in Sweden to assess your application early as well and provide feedback on your application. Rebecca? Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to actually um, add to that what you just said, uh, Johan, because it's um, it, it's something that comes up a lot. People ask whether they have like a better chance of admission, for example, if they apply early. But it's not that you have a better chance of admission if you apply early. It's more that by applying early, you have more time for, as Johan said, for the admission staff to actually look at your application and then um, give you feedback if there's something missing. So say you have three pages of a transcript and you've missed off page two or something, and they see that, then they, if they can, they will let you know. But they can only do that if you give them enough time and if you make sure that you submit your payment information um, as early as possible so that they can get on to looking at your application. So that's why we, we talk about this. It's not that applying early gives you any greater chance of entry. But of course, if you have all your documents in order, then that is the best thing you can do to give yourself a good chance. So yeah. Um, so as we say here, uh, point number six mentions that organize your official documents and submit these early on. And this is why we say this. Prepare the program specific documents according to the instructions for master's applicants. So make sure you read that program page carefully and prepare your documents um, for that and submit them. Ensure that all of your documents and the application fee are correctly submitted by the 1st of February. The deadlines are strict. And then check your university admissions in Sweden account and your email account regularly for any messages, even your spam folder. Because if the admission staff have noticed a small error or have said you're missing something, they will contact you about it. But if you don't receive that message, then of course, it's gonna be harder for you to correct it. So make sure that you check your, um, your spam or your junk folder as well on your email um, in case uh, there is an issue there with the email coming through and keep regularly checking back on your university admissions webpage. Okay, there's like a few final points, I think, on other ways to get more information about Lund University and get a sense for whether this is the right place for you. Um, Jan, would you like to go through? Sure. These? So this is something that we are offering uh, people who are considering coming to learn. Uh, we have a virtual tour that you can take. Um, if you go to our website, uh, you click on the link for the virtual tour and it will pop up. Uh, and here you can explore learned basically our campus our buildings you know everything that we believe is interesting for students who cannot actually join us here physically and check for themselves uh, to experience learn uh, the way we you know we we feel is appropriate for a uh, prospective student you can see the building or the buildings that you will have your program in and all the buildings like here we see for example the white house which is kind of a symbol of learned university the white building uh, not the white house i'm sorry about that. <laughs> the white <laughs> building right uh Huset, as it's called in swedish which is kind of a symbol for learned university and where uh, our vice chancellor uh university management basically used to work they're currently sitting somewhere else because this uh, building is being renovated but this building of course sits at the very heart of learned um, and it's one of the first buildings that you probably will want to see when you when you visit us here. But if you cannot come here physically to just check things out before you make your application, please go ahead and take the virtual tour. And you can find the link on our website if you go to learnuniversity.lu.sc. It's on the first page. So and you, in fact, um, Cecilia has just shared that. Oh, she she shared well, the link. So okay, excellent. You can also Thank access you. it here through mm -hmm. the chat. Excellent. Now, you may want to speak with current students of Lund University because we know we have talked a lot about everything here today, me and Rebecca. We are staff members, of course, of Lund University, but maybe you feel that, well, I'd rather listen to or speak with a current student. And you can do so because we have more than 80 students, uh, student ambassadors, who are willing and able to chat with you. And these people, they come from all over the world. And, and they represent or are currently enrolled in many, many different of our international degree programs here. And you can chat with them on our website and uh, through the Unibody system. And if I can just double check so to see, oh yeah, uh, we have a link uh, posted by Cecilia here. 
uh, learnuniversity.l.se slash chat with current students. If you go to that page, you're able to um, start a chat either with a person, a student, current student who comes from your country or someone who is currently enrolled in a program that you are interested in applying to. So you can contact them and, and start a chat and, and ask for their opinion and advice on various things re related to studying and learning. And of course, also on social media, I think we, you can find us in the usual places, Facebook, uh, YouTube, Instagram, etc. cetera. Um, especially Instagram, I think we would like to highlight here is a place where a lot of people like to go these days to find inspiration and, and see what it's like to study in Lund. And because we have student ambassadors, uh, do we change every week or is it every month? I forget. Um, I also forget, but I think it's uh, it's every every week <laughs> every week yeah. yeah so student ambassadors international students can take over the account and post the pictures of their life and learned as international students so lots of wonderful pictures about you know student activities basically both related to their studies of course but mainly i would guess social activities what can you do in your free time and learned is of course famous for its student life it's uh it's a city in Sweden, at least, that many Swedes <laughs> like to come to because the, the, the student life is famous, basically. And you can get a glimpse of this through our Instagram account at Lund University on Instagram. Uh, I will also add that I think Cecilia will share a couple more links regarding um, upcoming events, uh, including things. We run various events through the year, um, for example, applicant weeks and things like this. So have a look at the link to see what is most relevant and upcoming uh, at this time.